finally we get to my, one of my favorite units, the 1930s and the Great Depression. Lots and lots to talk about, so let's get started. So causes of the Great Depression, there's going to be some short term and long term. Long term, of course, is going to include no European needs for farm goods. Remember that we were giving people a lot of food during World War One. We were the num number one supplier and um, now they don't need our goods anymore. So that is definitely going to hurt our farmers and in the long run hurt all of us. We had been overproducing as well, again, because of World War I and the 1920s. Everybody was flashing money everywhere and buying things they didn't need. And I don't mean just going out and buying a pretty dress that you really don't need. I mean, people were spending money like there was no tomorrow, truly. And so because of that, production just kept up with the war production and finally people were starting to realize oh my gosh I don't need this stuff I can't afford this stuff and so the factories are still producing what they were produ producing but nobody's buying it and so they're starting to lose money too so now we have the farmers losing money and we have the industry losing money and then we did of course have a very easy money policy here in the United States credit was all the rage and of course you have to have credit you saw the parties that they had in the 1920s the overspending and so banks wanted people to feel secure in their country and in their bank and they were absolutely willing to basically give you whatever you wanted and you didn't have to have a whole lot of collateral so um, because back then there were no laws about it so if I if I loaned you money and just said hey you know you've got 30 years to put to pay this off as a bank I'm giving you 30 years to pay it off and then I change my mind there's no law to say I can't call you and say give me my money now or I'll take the house so it, it was a very easy money policy back then and people didn't look at the bad side of it they were only looking at the good side of it and that meant they're going to give me money to buy extravagant things that I don't really need and we also did something called buying on margin. Uh, buying on margin basically means that when you're buying stock, you don't have to pay for the full price of a stock. You go to a stockbroker and you pay usually 10%. Um, you pay 10% of whatever the stock is worth and then the stockbroker kind of fronts you the rest of, of that money. That's called buying on margin. You're just paying for a little margin of it out of your pocket, um, but you actually have this astronomical debt in some circumstances. So, but because you could buy on margin and only pay 10%, then people were buying stocks that they really truly couldn't afford if they had been uh, forced to pay for the full amount. And so when things start going belly up, those stockbrokers are going to be in, in a serious hurt because they have fronted all this money and when they turn to people to say hey I need that money the people don't have it so now we have farmers we have industry and we have the the money guys the money guys those stockbrokers are in serious trouble so this is long term now this is things that that you don't see right away and you know sometimes when you're when you're in it you don't really see it like there's this old adage that says if you put a frog in boiling water, he will jump right out, of course. But if you put a frog in cold water and slowly, slowly heat it up, he'll allow himself to be cooked to death. And that's basically what's happening here, that we are we are slowly cooking ourselves to death in, in uh, that kind of term. I know that's weird, but uh, we are. We're allowing bad things to happen and not doing anything about it because it's hard to see when you're in it. And so, again, these are all long-term things. Now, some immediate causes include, of course, the crash of the stock market. I hate it when people say it's actually a cause of the depression. Um, the, the depression is what caused the stock market to crash. And then when it crashed, it made the, the depression even worse. So you could say it's it's a cause. Your state people for the curriculum say that it's a cause. But really, the, the depression caused the stock market to crash, which deepened the depression. I hope that makes sense to you. Uh, of course, all the banks are going to collapse. Everybody's saying, I want my money now. And they did something called running on banks. And basically, that meant that everybody was truly running to the bank as fast as they could possibly run and pulling out all of their money. And it, it was first come, first serve. Of course, a bank didn't have everybody's uh, money there. No, they use money. When you put money in a bank, they use it for investments, the bank does. So they don't have every every cent of every customer's money in the bank nobody does so again they ran on the banks 
literally emptying out the vaults. And of course, because of all this, the money supply is going to shrink. Uh, nobody's going to be issuing loans. And um, everybody's just kind of stuck with what they have. And if the bank didn't have your money when you went to go and get it, too bad. So sad. There are no insurances. There are no laws. It's just luck of the draw who made it to the bank first. And then, of course, we have the Holly Smoot Tariff, which you learned um, in uh, World 2 class, hopefully. 1929, uh, our President Hoover, who was a genius before he became president, um, but Hoover's response to um, helping money matters here in the United States was a Holly Smoot Tariff. And Holly and Smoot are two men who created the highest tax on imports ever, ever, ever across the world um, in some ports in the United States people were paying a hundred percent to bring their goods into America um, it was that high and and Hoover really thought people would still bring their goods from foreign countries even though the import taxes were astronomical and we would make money that way but what really happened is people went home they charged their own astronomically high import taxes on everybody else retaliatory taxes and suddenly there was no trade happening everybody was shut down because no one was willing to pay those high tariffs and nobody was willing to lower the tariffs as long as the united states kept theirs up so the holly smoot tariff and our president hoover strangled trade across the entire world we are the fault at fault for causing the depression to go worldwide all right, so let's look at Hoover. I want you to, to remember, again, we, we learned about him in the last unit that he was actually a pretty smart guy when it came to uh, figuring out how to feed poor people and get people out of debt, but he just cannot face the fact that we are seriously in trouble. So let's look at some of, his, some of the things he did in his first years. So he's going to be president from 29 to 33. Okay, so make sure you know that. He's a Republican, 29 to 33. He believed that government interventions should be very, very limited, and it didn't matter what we're talking about here, whether you're talking about controlling money, whether you're talking about retirement for people, uh, Medicare, Medicaid type things did not exist, and he didn't think they should. Uh, he really felt like the government should not get in the business of its people or in the business of business. So he had a very hands-off approach at a time when the country needed somebody to put their hands on this problem and take care of it, and he was not willing to do so. So here's what he believed. People will come to depend on the government aid and refuse to work. Well, part of what he thought has come true, I think that we do have some people in this country, maybe a lot, that are um, on disability and shouldn't be, or welfare and shouldn't be, but he really felt like it would, it would destroy the country, that no one would work anymore, and it was going to be like a free ride, and so he said no, no government aid uh, for people, go to work. And then, of course, the stock market crashed in October of 1929. This is what he said about it. While the crash only took place six months ago, I'm convinced we have now passed the worst. And with continued unity of effort, we shall rapidly recover. No, we're not going to, Hoover. We're not going to. But he thought that it was just a passing thing. We've had depressions in this country before. And they did kind of come and go. But this one is serious. This one is not going to go away. And Hoover just did not see that. He could not see that. So, of course, we talked about the Holly Smoot. He was asked, you know, are you going to do something to fix it? And here's his response. I have no intention of reducing the tariff. It will be our saving grace. <laughs> no, it was not our saving grace. Again, remember, it shut trade down across the world. And then we had something that was not Hoover's fault, but he didn't respond to it well enough either. Um, this was Mother Nature's uh, event. It was called the Dust Bowl in 1931. Okay, again, it is a natural event, 1931, the Dust Bowl. So let's find out about that. All right, so the Dust Bowl, of course, goes all the way back to the Homestead Act of 1862. Who was the president who created that Homestead Act to get people to move out to the West and start farming? It was our own beloved Abraham Lincoln. I hope you already knew that. 
So he gets people to go out west and do all kinds of farming. And um, they really, really did overuse the land. But when we got to World War I, because we were feeding so many people um, in foreign nations, we really, really abused the land out west. And the land out west is not like it is here on the east coast where, you know, on the east coast, you, you plant a little clover in a field for a season and that clover replenishes the soil, the nutrients in it, and then it's good to, for a crop for you know three or four years and then you do the clover again land out west isn't like that land out west is very fragile and we had been overusing it for years and then doubled that abuse during World War I. And then on top of that, there was a severe drought in 1930. And the drought dried everything out. The soil became completely dead. And all there, all there really basically was is, is this thin layer of soil that wasn't attached to anything. It couldn't grow anything. And so in 1931, severe windstorms began in the West, and basically it blew everything away. There were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people that were left with nothing. It buries everything, and these winds don't just blow in 1931. They blow for three years. So you have all these people out West that have nowhere to go and nothing to come back to um, if they could come back because everything is going to be buried. This soil truly, truly just blew in the, in the wind. I'm going to show you a fantastic picture in a minute. It just blew and covered everything. You could not go out of your house without having every hole in your face covered up, your ears, your nose, your mouth. You would suffocate because there was so much sand and dirt in the air. Just unbelievable. Mother Nature was mad. All right, so here you see that giant cloud. It's it's a coming. It's coming to get all those people, and it will truly bury houses to where you only saw the rooftops. So those people that are standing in the front yard staring at it, if they don't get in the house soon, they're going to regret it because it's going to be in their face, in their throat, in their eyes, um, and it is relentless. So it's not just it's not just this dirty air. It's ferocious wind on top of it. So not a good place to be standing right now. And I love this picture. So people tried to get away. They they heard that, you know, things were happening and the winds were coming their way. And so they got in their cars and they tried to get away. But the sand got in their motors and shut their cars off. So nothing mechanical would work in the Dust Bowl either. I mean, who would have thought of that? Uh, just incredible, incredible loss for all the people in uh, living in this area. The number one hit area was Oklahoma. That's where the biggest majority of people lost everything in the Dust Bowl. Um, and so many people that, that travel to different states, um, if you said I came from the Dust Bowl, people would just naturally assume that you came from Oklahoma. And so these Dust, dust Bowl victims became known as Okies. Even if they weren't from Oklahoma, they were Dust Bowl victims looking for a new life. So they were called Okies. And there you go. See, he's running from it. Hopefully he's going to beat it. Another Okie on the run. And there you go. Yep. Maybe it's the same guy and he didn't get away. I don't know. But uh, bad things happen. So that should give you an idea of how deep it was. Deeper in some areas. This is just one example. Look at that. House top. No house left. Many people that did stay around, you see how the kids are dressed, um, look like scary little monsters. Um, if you if you stayed around and you breathe this stuff in continuously, you got something called dust pneumonia. And um, it was a, a horrible, horrible infliction where your lungs were filled with dirt and sand and you could not catch a full breath. So really bad stuff. People died from it. All right, so you see the heart of it. And the heart of it again is right there over Oklahoma, but you can see you can see that it does include um, many other states. But again, the Oki, everybody that was that had to actually move and migrate out of there, were they were all nicknamed Oki, whether they were from Nebraska or Kansas or Colorado, New Mexico. The majority of them are going to come from Oklahoma because they're the hardest hit. You can see that, and so they are all named Oki. Um, at one point, so many of them were pouring into California that California actually closed. They had signs on every entrance in, in California and lined the perimeter 
we are closed. We do not want anybody else here, especially not Okies, because they come with nothing. So how will they contribute to our economy, which is already bad? So you kind of get it. So Okies got a really bad reputation. Um, not that they were doing anything wrong. It was just that here they were so poor and in such need in a time when the whole country was that people just didn't want to mess with them. We, we don't have anything for you. Go away kind of mentality. All right, so Hoover's response, what will his response be? He believed the government intervention should be limited, remember, and he said that people will come to depend on the government, and so basically he does nothing. That is what he does. He does nothing. He asks individ individual um, entities and organizations to help people out, and you see the Red Cross symbol here. The Red Cross was helping people bringing them food whenever they could but very often they didn't have enough people to deliver it and even if they had food in a warehouse to be distributed the food was rotten before they had time to because hoover won't let government people go in and help them distribute it so uh not working out very well so people ate basically anything that you could think of and i'm not kidding anything they ate bark off of trees they they boiled grass and made stew out of it whatever whatever they could get their hands on because the president was not helping them and Red Cross and other organizations could only do so much. So Hoover did try and make jobs for people um, a little bit too late but one of the big 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 productions under Herbert Hoover was of course the Hoover Dam. So um, this was a public works project started in 1931 in Nevada and it is it is truly a wonder. Um, it is very 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 massive very intimidating um, a place that you really should try and visit at least once in your lifetime um, it wasn't the the be all end all for creating jobs that hoover wanted it to be but it was a successful project but once it's over you know the people packed up and went home and their paycheck is done but the hoover dam still stands i think they should take his name off of it to be honest with you can you tell i don't like the man um i just think he had such a genius for helping people and suddenly when his own people need him he can he went to africa and helped all kinds of people he went to latin america and helped all kinds of people but america needs him and he he turned his back no government uh government influence here not going to help you kind of thing i just think it's ridiculous anyway moving on there's the hoover dam again it is beautiful it's beautiful look at that and that's from afar my husband and i went there a couple years ago so he, these are our pictures so Herbert Hoover did decide that he needed to help the farmers and he created something called the Federal Farm Board. Um, what, what was happening was we had a huge surplus of wheat in the United States and, and cotton and we wanted to get it into the market before the rest of the world realized what a surplus we had because if you have a surplus that means prices are going to be low and so if the rest of the world found out that we had a surplus they would sell their stuff really super cheap and we would be left out in the cold so america tried to keep the secret didn't work the world found out that we had a huge surplus and so basically we made everyone's wheat and cotton pretty much worthless so again we're affecting the world so the holly smoot tariff we're, we're affecting the world and now with this federal farm board so we were found out but the board did also uh, make some other very weird decisions um they decided that if you if they made it so that there was not a surplus of anything it would help the farmers and that meant goats and cows and horses and whatever else you can think of fields of wheat get rid of it all so kill the animals any any animals that you don't absolutely need burn any fields you don't absolutely need and we will no longer have a surplus and suddenly everything will be worth tons of money again does it work no it does not um, all it does is kill a lot of poor poor innocent animals but at least Hoover was attempting. Um, didn't work, but at least he was attempting. You got to give him that. All right. So the worst part of his presidency, in my mind, is um, comes under the, the label of the bonus army. If you remember back in World War I, when our government was trying to convince young men to get on those ships and go over and part of the convoy system and protect Britain and be part of the, of the military and get in those trenches and fight in France, he promised them several things. One was a, was a college education 
very few men will ever use that. The other one was that they would only be gone a month or two and come home heroes. That did not happen. Most of them came home with a physical or mental um, issue when they came back and they were all there for at least a year. The third thing that they promised them was a bonus. That when they got older, ready for retirement, they would have a bonus. So here is the depression and the people who had enlisted, these young men who had enlisted in World War I, come to Washington. 43,000 of them come. They call themselves the bonus army. They want their bonus early. It was promised to them. They want it now. They're not going to wait until their retirement age. They all need money. And so they come to D.C. to get it from him. And so they're sitting on the White House steps. See this? 43,000 people. They knock on the door and say, hey, we would like to have our bonus now. And of course, he's going to say no to them. So they set up right outside of the White House and all over D.C. They set up these little uh, little cities, I guess you could say, and they called them Hoovervilles. And they were living in them. Some of them were nothing more than cardboard boxes. Some of them had nothing. You can see these people just sleeping on the lawn. But they were going to stay there until Herbert Hoover agreed to give them a bonus. And so, of course, he's got to do something. He can't just leave these people living here like this forever so you see uh most of us will be dead by 1945 the year 17 to 18 has been forgotten they're talking about the war my home in washington in a burial case um so he's sleeping in what looks like a coffin basically is what he's saying um we want employment not charity give us some money that you owe us basically is what they're saying you saw this kind of crazy stuff all over the place um, and of course they're picketing we want money we want our money now and of course there is going to be a lot of incidences where people are fighting getting hurt um, and the cops will of course have to do something eventually um, so what happens is um, Herbert Hoover decides that he's got to get rid of these people and so he tells his military and and the police force do whatever you have to do to get rid of these people and their solution was to start burning down the hooverville so they burned them down um, they threw smoke bombs in some of the tents a couple of babies died because of asthma problems the smoke bombs set the asthma off and they died and now all of a sudden herbert hoover um, has burned down homes and he's a baby killer so his reputation is never going to, to survive this. It just gets worse and worse and worse for Herbert Hoover. Just seems to make every decision wrong for this time period. So the bonus army is not going to get what they want out of Herbert Hoover. So Herbert had a uh, wife by the name of Lou. You see her here. They had a very... Um, different relationship I think that they really did love one another but but he listened to Lou a little bit too much he was the political head um, she was kind of a, a, a socially awkward she didn't understand really what it meant to be the president and how open your life would be and she wanted to keep a lot of their life private and secret and so she insisted that whenever they were in public together when they spoke to one another they would speak in Chinese so only he and her would know what they were talking about and of course that really put people off that you know you're here I am talking to the president and his wife and they're speaking Chinese so I don't understand what they're talking about that's uh, pretty crazy uh, Lou also insisted that every single night they have a very very large dinner and invite very prominent people including the media make sure there's lots of pictures every single night and I'm talking like these 10 course meals um, she thought that it would do the public good to know that their president and his wife were being well fed in these troubling times and that they were safe and happy and healthy but the public did not appreciate that uh, where's their 10 course meal so just a very very uh, different couple who, who truly did not understand society at all so president always threw the first ball of the season for the baseball season so you see in 1930 um, he here he is he's throwing out the ball first season right by 1931 
he's getting ready to throw the first ball and they actually had him go out on the mound in 31 to throw it not from the stands like he is in 1930 and it was a setup in 1931 people had brought rotten food with them in their pockets and when he walked out to the base uh, to throw the first ball they threw the food and so he was escorted of course by bodyguards off of the field and didn't really see Herbert Hoover in public after that um, rotten eggs rotten tomatoes will definitely keep you out of the public eye all right so let's talk about life for people during the great depression we know what's happening with our president he's being an idiot um, we had unemployment 25 percent of our people were unemployed by 1933 uh, many more were what we call underemployed so their their hours were cut maybe in half or, or more um, so maybe they weren't unemployed but they definitely weren't making the money that they had once made and so their way of life is going to change forever too hundreds of thousands are going to be homeless um, they created again the Hoovervilles those were not just in DC they were everywhere and these are again makeshift houses made out of boxes uh, boards if you could find them anything that you could find um, and that would have been in the cities now in the outside outskirts of the cities as people were migrating from town to town to town trying to find a job and I mean people were going coast to coast like walking or riding a train coast to coast they would stop in these little uh, makeshift um, camps across the United States that were you know out outdoors and they were called jungles and you would have uh, like mirrors hanging from all the trees so you could get up in the morning and shave um, they had makeshift tents that people could stay in and people just kind of came and went uh, very very dangerous places because if you did walk in there with anything somebody else is going to want it um, so usually the jungles were not very safe at all and this was more of a man thing than a woman thing a woman would very seldom be um, in a jungle uh, for obvious reasons so it was kind of a man place but again even for the men very dangerous and there you go there's a picture of the jungle so sitting uh, usually by water of course and you can see that they've got other stuff hanging out to dry it's all men um, so you know that was their life I mean they had no homes a lot of these guys are going to run away from their families they can't face the fact that they can't take care of them and so they will spend many years living in jungles and walking from place to place looking for a job through the entire depression and there's some of the Hoovervilles in the cities So men and teens did uh, many things uh, to get from place to place, but the biggest option was to ride the rails. So you had a lot of people that um, left home way too young, girls and boys, and, and rode the rails. A lot of men, again, would leave because they were... Um, upset that they couldn't pay for their family anymore they couldn't bring bring the money home anymore and they were watching their children starve and so they rode the rails lots of people got hurt riding the rails very often there wasn't enough room especially uh, for the kids that were riding it and so they were forced to sit on top of the train which um, in the cold months you could freeze to death uh, at night if you didn't know where you were headed you could you could um, be knocked off if you went into a tunnel or um, low hanging branches you could be knocked right off the top of the train and killed that way so you can see a picture of that here not just one or two people it's a lot of people on top of that train very very dangerous lots of deaths because of this now women what are women going to be doing and children too young to be a teenager to ride the rail they're going to be pea pickers so that was the number one job of a female and children during this time period peas pea fields were everywhere and peas are are very easy to pick for people that have tiny fingers because you pop the pod open and you scrape it out with your little tiny fingers men would have a really hard time popping that pod and and scraping the peas out and it's backbreaking work men are not men are bigger than women they're not meant to uh, be able to bend over or crouch down for the length of, of time that a woman or a child can it literally would ruin a man's back uh, women are more resilient for that type of thing and so men were not hired to be pea pickers women and children were and these women and children would follow the pea, pea picker 
um, season. And so you finished one field and you moved on to another. So they weren't living in jungles, but it, it was like a makeshift kind of community at each farm until the farm was harvested and then they would move on to the next one. So everyone's migrating, everybody, men and teens on the rails, women and children with the pea pickers. And there are some of the pea pickers out in the field. So you see the men to carry them. But out in the field, it's going to be mostly women. Lots and lots of peas. So there was a famous photographer during the time named Dorothea Lang. And Dorothea Lang is um, the reason that we know how horrible the Depression was. She traveled the entire United States and took pictures and told the story of the Depression. She wanted to make sure that we never forgot how bad it was. It's kind of like Eisenhower uh, making everybody take take pictures of the people in the Holocaust camps before you help them we, ha we have to remember that that this happened and so this young woman became a um, a part of a series that Dorothea Lang did you see her with her three children I don't know if you can tell but she's actually holding a baby and she was a pea picker as were her children and they travel from farm to farm together picking these peas and Dorothea Lang did a whole layout on this woman and what her life was like in pictures so this woman is only 33 years old in my mind she looks a whole lot older than that you can see how filthy the children are just a horrible life and of course this woman's husband like many had run off and so she was left with finding the means to take care of her children and being a pea picker was it. Uh, look at the boy in the middle. Now, how old do you think he is? Like 12? But he's a man. Like he has to be a man already smoking cigarettes. Just, just, I mean, these stories, you can't really write about it. You need to see it. And that was what she did. So you see Dorothea Lang over here on the right, an amazing lady willing to sleep in the dirt and you know go in dangerous places like the jungles and take pictures so that we would know we would we would be able to talk about it today so you can see some of the things that um, people were willing to do for children for sale inquire within look at this um, jobless men keep going we can't take care of our own you know, I mean, and, and men were, um, usually we say, oh, at least men had it. Men could get up and leave their family. A woman stuck with the kids. No, they're not. They're selling their children. Uh, the men would be beat up very, very often if uh, this town said we don't need them. This is the Chamber of Commerce that wrote this sign saying, you know, get out of here. We don't need you. The line you see over here is a bread line. And people would get in the bread lines very, very early. This is probably um, Al Capone's uh, bread line. Oh, I don't know. Maybe this is, that might be New York. I'm not sure. But you you should know that Al Capone is one of the guys that created the very first bread line. And he made his men actually stand there and hand it out, you know, his big goon men, because um, the president wasn't doing anything or offering any relief. So bread lines uh, existed across all the major cities in the United States. And you truly got up while it was still dark to go get in the line. So this is, these are not people at the end of the day. This is people at the beginning of the day, hoping and praying that there will be bread left when they when their turn comes look at the cars can't use cars anymore who can afford gas so you have tons of places like this wouldn't you love to be able to go back in time and say I'll take that one into the future with me um, but you know people how could you afford to, to have a car anymore you, nobody could afford gas everyone walked or rode the trains and that was it so I love this. The, some people don't want to give their cars up. So look what they do with them. But these are these are called the Hoover cars. There they are. So you have Hoover Vills for people to live in and Hoover cars uh, with no motor being pulled by a horse. Look at this. If you did have a car, it might be your house. And notice that he's close to a train, so if he wants to hop it, he can. This probably is just a car that he found. He probably got off of that train and found a car and has been living in it for a while, and then he can hop the train again whenever he's ready. All right, so let's talk about some Hooverisms, things that people came up with to blame Hoover and, and you know, uh, rub his name in the mud, basically. We talked about Hoovervilles, and again, it's those makeshift cities that people put up all over the place uh, poor 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 places the Hoover car I showed you a picture of that 
Waving the Hoover flag, I don't know if I found a picture of that or not. I'll have to see what pops up here. Waving the Hoover flag meant that you were supposed to wear your pockets inside out, like pull them out so people could see that they were empty. And that was called waving the Hoover flag. My pockets are empty and it's Hoover's fault, so I'm waving my Hoover flag. Oh, yeah, there you go. There we go. I, I knew I would have one someplace, but he's waving his Hoover flag. Um, Hoover blankets were newspapers, and the newspapers would leave uh, whatever they didn't sell outside for people to come and, and get and use as, as mats or as blankets. So that's a Hoover blanket. Hoover shoes, holy shoes, basically. And I mean, when your shoes start to wear out, you, would, you then you would say, oh, look, I have Hoover shoes. So uh, wear out because you can't get new ones. And then, of course, we have, um, look at the way that they use Hoover's Poor Farm Tobacco Fund. Hard times are still hoovering over us. So they used his name in all kinds of, of ways to show their disdain for him and their absolute hate for him. So, of course, the election of 1932 is not going to be a giant surprise. Look at the states that... <laughs> That voted for Hoover and the ones that voted for FDR. Yeah, FDR just kind of ran away with it. I think that um, maybe anybody would have run away with it that much at that point because Hoover was so hated. Um, but thank God we had FDR because I do think that he saved this nation. All right, so Franklin's motto was relief, recovery, reform. That's what he walked in the door with. Make sure you know his three R's. That's what he referred to them as, my three R's. So kick out the depression with a Democratic vote was his platform that he ran on. And he very often had fireside chats. Um, I think, oh, I guess we haven't talked about that yet, yet this year. His fireside chats was a way to get people to uh, feel comfortable with him. And the fireside chats were supposed to be him sitting beside the fireplace, you know, maybe even in his home, talking to Americans who were sitting by their fireplace at home. And he would open every single speech, especially the fireside chats, but every speech with my friends so that people felt like he was one of us. He's on our level. I'm his friend. And in these fireside chats, anything that, that was facing America that he thought might scare Americans, like here's a new plan that we're going to do, he would take the fireside chats and explain it to them in very simple terms so that we always felt like we were informed and that he was taking care of us and he knew what he was doing and he also promised in those fireside chats that he would try something new and if it wasn't working right away he would throw it out and start something else and you know for our government to say that is a miracle an absolute miracle we we love to keep things around even when everybody in the United States says it's stupid we just can't get ourselves to get rid of stuff but not FDR FDR promised that that he would throw out anything that wasn't working and by golly he meant it and this is his big uh, claim to fame about the depression we have nothing to fear but fear itself make sure you know that quote and that he's referring to the depression and the means to get out of that depression we have nothing to fear but fear itself so he's saying we're going to try new stuff so in his mind this whole um, plan that he comes up with the relief recovery reform all the laws legislation all the new um, departments and organizations that he creates all of this is called the new deal so we have nothing to fear but fear itself and now let me show you here what what we're going to actually give you and that is going to be the new deal now why did he say a new deal it sounds like like you're playing a game of cards that's exactly what he wanted it to sound like. He um, that was the number one pastime in this time period. Everybody played cards. Even people who didn't have didn't have houses anymore had cards. Everybody played them, and so he wanted it to be something named something that people would feel comfortable with and familiar with. Um, oh yeah, we're getting a new deal. Um, so he wanted everybody to be able to understand what he was talking about at all times. He's brilliant. He is absolutely brilliant. So in his 100 days, the first 100 days of his uh, presidency, he created 
and often threw away more legislation in his 100 days than any other president has ever created in his entire presidential term. And he did it in 100 days. He basically went to Congress and said, you're not saying no to me. Whatever I want, I'm going to get. I'm going to save this country. And Congress threw their arm, hands up and said, you've got it. Whatever you want. So, again, an amazing man who could convince Congress to do this. But they knew that we were in dire straits and something had to be done to save our country. And so they were, here's a guy who's saying, I can do it. Stand back and let me. And they said, okay. So let's see how smart this guy is. Uh, he created something called a bank holiday, FDR did, and it was a four-day closing of all the banks in the entire United States. And he told people that the banks will stay closed until they are deemed sound. So what he did is he hired a crew of financial experts, and I'm saying that in quotes, financial experts, and they showed up. Um, very uh, under very much a media frenzy in every single town in America and they were in these uh, you know very serious black suits and they had very serious black briefcases and they went into the bank and they locked themselves in there for four days and the understanding was that at the end of four days they would throw the door open and announce this bank is safe it shall remain open to the public or this bank is not safe and it will close forever so they made this big show of it and it actually worked people people when when the guys came out and said this bank is safe we're leaving it open people started to bring their money back to the bank i mean how can you have a safe economy or a healthy economy if we don't have any banks and that fdr knew that so he's got to find a way to get people to believe in the banks again now were these guys really experts no they were actors he hired them to go into the bank and for four days they sat in there and ate donuts and played cards and you know whatever else they could do to pass the time they knew well in advance what their lines were when they opened the door four days later they were actors they were given a line by the president and the real financial geniuses who decided well in advance which banks was, banks would stay open and stay closed so they had a line to read this bank is safe or this bank is unsafe so why go to such extremes and lie to the people lie to the people of, of the united states seriously think about it this way if he had just said on, on the radio, for instance. Um, okay, so here's a list of banks that will be closing, and here's a list of banks that will be remaining open. The end. So would you would you have any buy-in to that? You know, if you hear on the radio, okay, well, Stephen City's uh, banks are safe. They're going to stay open. But that Woodstock bank, uh-uh, getting rid of that sucker. That, that, doesn't, that doesn't make you think that this is real and that it's safe. But to actually see the men go into the bank, these experts, these guys that look so serious, go into the bank and they come out four days later and they're not saying every bank is safe. They are saying some of them are not. It can't be a trick. It must be true. And by golly, it did work. It absolutely worked because he did it the way that he did it. Did he lie? Yes, he did. And thank God he did because it convinced Americans to start putting their money back into the banks. And we needed that. We had to have that to start bringing our economy back. He also created something called the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation or the FDIC. Um, this is insurance so that if, if something like this ever happened again, you would never go down to the bank and be told, hey, all the money's gone. Sorry, sorry, you're, you're out all your money, which is what happened during the Depression. Remember when they did those bank runs? Um, once the bank was emptied out, it was emptied out, and whoever didn't get their money never got their money. So the FDIC is now, it used to be a, for every $100,000 bank account, um, you could you could get all your money back, so up to $100,000, but I think they recently changed it to 250000 Like, I'd have to worry about either one, but anyway, there is insurance now. Um, never, ever, ever put your money in a financial institution that is not backed up by the FDIC, and they really are serious about this, so serious that um, many years ago when I taught U.S. history for the first time, I was so excited, and I was getting ready to do the Depression, and I went into my local bank, and I said to the lady, can I have that FDIC sign that you have sitting on the counter? I want to show it to my kids so they know what to look for when they go into their own financial institutions. And she said, sure, you can take it, 
but we'll have to arrest you for it. So they're not playing around. You can't claim you're part of the FDIC or have any of their, you know, official things. You have to actually be part of the FDIC. So look for that in any financial institute that you ever go into. And if they don't have it there clearly, clearly displayed, they're probably not part of it. Walk out. He also created something to make the stock market safe. And this is a Security and Exchange Commission, the SEC. So they are the babysitter of the stock market to make sure that no hokey pokey stuff is going on in there and um, nothing can get, get out of control again. It's, it's an official babysitter of the stock market. Now, in, in FDR's mind, the farmers are really important, where they have been kind of just dismissed by Herbert Hoover. And so he creates something called the Agricultural Adjustment Act, or the AAA. And this is a group designed to go research what, what needs to be done for farmers to make them healthy again. And it was uh, supposed to raise prices of agricultural goods by doing a few things that Hoover had suggested, but he did it in a weird way. One of the things is that he asked farmers to reduce production. So he wasn't like Hoover um, going out and burning down fields of, of good food. He was asking them to produce less and he gave them money to, to produce less. So the farmers weren't losing out and they were very willing to produce less to try and pop those prices up. He also had them, just like Hoover, killing livestock, but he paid them for the livestock. So if you've ever seen the movie um, Silence of the Lambs, and um, the girl is, she said one of the worst memories of her life, she heard all these lambs screaming because they were killing them. That's what, the, that's what it was. They were killing the livestock under the AAA, but they did it, um, it was actually a plan, like which animals should we kill? They, they paid for all of them, so farmers aren't out um, because they killed their livestock, they're getting paid for it. So the big difference from what Hoover did. He also gave a loan assistance for agricultural people, and that still exists today. If you're a farmer and you have a bad year or bad season, um, there is loan assistance there that's just for farmers. And then he also provided mortgage relief so that farmers were not losing their farm. And again, if you are a farmer and you uh, need a certain... Uh, thing for your mortgage maybe you're a little bit behind or something it's still there so loan assistance like to get seed for a new crop or mortgage relief to keep your farm still there but they were created under FDR of course FDR knew that he had to work to get to put everybody back to work it wasn't just about the farmers he needed everybody to get back to work and so he created tons of public work works projects, one of the more famous ones being the Tennessee Valley Authority. Um, the Tennessee Valley Authority built this giant dam in the Tennessee Valley in places that had been continuously flooding and people in the Tennessee Valley were hit really really hard by the depression and on top of it they were being flooded constantly and so he created this to give them jobs but it was also to build this dam to stop the flooding and to give them a source of electricity. And so you can imagine the number of people that were employed to build this giant, giant dam, which is still around today. He also created an organization called the Public Works Administration. And this put people, or the PWA, know all these initials, you gotta know them all. Uh, the PWA put people who had um, experience in certain kind of jobs, like technical jobs, he found them a place. And one of the big things that they, they got to do was build extravagant um, things but things that were needed and one of the big things that we needed in 1934 was the Lincoln Tunnel and so it is um, it's done in 1934 and you can see the pictures where they're they're doing it inside dangerous dangerous work um, but actually not a lot of accidents on it because these are experts he hired these experts that have been making really good money on their jobs before the depression and now they're making good money again and so we get the Lincoln Tunnel out of it so make sure you know the TVA for Tennessee Valley Authority building that giant dam in the Tennessee Valley and then the PWA for giant works projects outside of the the TVA like like the Lincoln Tunnel so massive building projects think about that when you hear the Public Works Administration so let's continue and find out what other people he found jobs for. We've got skilled ones in the, P in the PWA. 
uh, we need a place to put unskilled people. And so that became a, a organization called the CCC or the Civilian Conservation Corps. And these are the people that built parks all across the United States. Most of the parks that are around today, and I mean even the little ones, most of the parks that are around today were invented or created during this time period and done by the CCC. 5% of all men alive in this time period, 5% worked in the CCC in the entire United States. That's that's a pretty big number. Uh, the cool thing about the CCC is you they hired anybody. They hired black, they hired white, they hired Indian. Um, if you were a World War I vet and you wanted a job, you were getting one in the CCC. They, they didn't turn down any vets. So you've got this mixture of people who are unskilled but still need a job working together. Now the only bad thing is um, you, had to, you had to go to the job like you lived in the park as you were developing it. And so you had to have living quarters for all these people and they they segregate them so you still have segregated uh, groups for the CCC but at least they're allowing allowing all colors to work and all um, ethnic groups too so the CCC was was monstrous but it's not the biggest of all the groups that he created. The biggest one is the WPA. So you have the PWA for the skilled people, the CCC for the unskilled people. The WPA or the Works Progress Administration is for those unique people that have a hard time fitting in and in, in a normal job. Um, and these are like artists, um, musicians, people that are creative and he didn't want them to have to give up their passions and their talent to um, go work in a thing in, in an organization like the CCC. He wanted to keep that alive. So he created the WPA. It's mostly for ty different types of artists, musician kind of thing. Um, and it, it basically was designed to to here's the last group of people that we don't have a job for and these are the people that are now riding the rails and walking back and forth across the United States and we don't want people walking anymore or traveling anymore we want them to stay where they are it's less trouble if they stay home stay where you are and so the WPA was created with that in mind that it would keep those ragtag group of people that had no place it would keep them home and so a lot of times they ended up um, being artists and they painted pictures in government buildings including post offices and so um, I forget exactly where the one on the left is but it's a post office painting done by the WPA the one over here on the right hand side is actually from uh, Strasburg Virginia their little uh, post office and so they framed it and put glass over it that's why you see the reflection I couldn't get he wouldn't turn the lights off for me so there wouldn't be a reflection but they're still around today you just got to take the time whenever you go into an old post office make sure you look because if it's old enough there's going to be a WPA uh, rendering in there someplace so look for it and so let's look at a little bit of direct relief from the New Deal program that he created. You've got the jobs and stuff, but people need something right now. And so he created something called the Social Security Act for older people in the United States. Uh, still around today, of course, and it's pension for retirees. Um, it also is unemployment insurance as part of it. I think today they're actually uh, two separate entities at the federal level but it started out as unemployment insurance was the same as social security and it is funded of course by employer contributions they take money out of your check and they also um, put some money themselves into this account uh, for social security and it is of course the beginning of that social safety net or the welfare state that we have become so there there was relief at the time when people needed it and and my gosh if you didn't have unemployment insurance and and things like that and certain types of welfare now our country would not be doing as well as it is it's just gotten to the point where too many people take advantage of it and lie about stuff um, but at this time period I mean people needed it and and they loved FDR for giving it to him. All right, so let's go back to the bonus army. We have a new president now, and so the bonus army comes back again. 
and this time when they knock on the door it is not the president of the united states that answers the door it is not his military with get guns raised answering the door it's eleanor and eleanor invites them into the white house i love this woman she invites them into the white house and she has tea with them and then she goes to their little hoovervilles and and because she wants to make sure that they know she's not too good to come to them and so she goes to them and of course she starts asking questions you know what can I do for you and 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 we want our bonus and she said look I'm just going to be honest with you we don't have the money we do not have the money to pay you but if you want a job in any of the organizations that we've created under the new deal I will guarantee you a job you're going to have one and so she most of them will end up going to the CCC because they're not super skilled people so she gets them all jobs and look how happy they are so this is what what one of the guys said and it kind of became their mantra hoover gave us bullets and fdr gave us eleanor that's the difference between these two presidents so eleanor makes a name for herself and for her husband because of these kind of things that she does so let's look at women. Women, of course, are going to be highly affected by um, by the depression. Their lives are going to be turned upside down. Um, and Eleanor Roosevelt knows this and wants to do something to help. So she is very much more liberal than FDR. She does some crazy things. Um, but she is the first truly politically active first lady in the United States. I mean, we've got other ones like Dolly Madison that, you know, help with parties and things like that. But Eleanor is going to get long laws passed. She's going to create organizations. Um, she was just a, an incredible, incredible woman. Um, she wanted to make sure that women across America knew that they were all facing the same issues. And so she created a newspaper column dedicated just to women. And it was called My Day. And it was about things that that women had concerns about and sometimes it was solutions to those concerns. But honestly, just to know that that many women were going through the same thing even Eleanor herself made it a lighter load for for the ladies she also created a daycare for working women um, and she they I hate saying it like this but you got to you got to remember the time period now um, you, you can't have a daycare that's going to take black children and white children into the same daycare so Eleanor understood that and so she created two daycares one for black children one for white children and hers were equal if it was a government funded daycare they were equal it was not like the separate but equal not really equal doctrine no not like that at all it was a daycare run by caring people who did a good job and the babies were in a safe place so she also had press press conferences and often only allowed female reporters in. So at that time, it was considered to be a female reporter that you were probably too emotional to actually be a really good reporter. Um, you would allow your emotions to sway your convictions. And so very few females were allowed to be reporters at the time. And she blew that out of the water. She wouldn't let men in. And of course, everybody wants to interview the first lady, especially an active first lady. And so she, a lot of times she left the men out of this. And of course, she is uh, very much a civil rights activist. We will talk about that much more when we get into the World War II unit and the things that she did for um, blacks serving in the military. But please do know that she was she was the queen of civil rights and and she wasn't doing it for publicity this this woman just could not believe that this country was still separated by color and she wanted to do something about it and she did many things about it uh, one of my one of my favorite stories about her and civil rights um, happened with Marian Anderson this very beautiful woman that you see standing next to Eleanor down here on the left um, Eleanor uh, Marian Anderson had probably the most beautiful female voice I have ever heard just just unbelievably beautiful and so she was asked to come to the White House and sing for Easter Sunday and so Eleanor was so excited to invite her and then at the last minute um, FDR and his little um, advisors realized that Marion was a black woman 
And so FDR says, look, Eleanor, I know you don't want to hear this, but, um, you know, race issues are still really, really touchy. We can't have Marian Anderson singing at the White House, not for Easter Sunday. And so Eleanor, being Eleanor, said, fine, dear, we, we, won't ha- we won't have her sing at the White House. So behind everyone's back, she canceled the entire to-do at the White House for um, Easter Sunday, including the egg rolling, which was created by Dolly Madison and held every Easter Sunday since. She canceled it all and moved the entire thing to a local park, uh, a public park. So no one could tell her that Marian Anderson could not sing that day. And Marian did sing and it was beautiful and everyone fell in love with her. And of course, Eleanor, Eleanor had her way. I would love to have heard the conversation between her and FDR that night. My guess is that Eleanor won the argument. Um, but there you go. Marian Anderson and they became very good friends and, and did many things together after that. Um, She also wanted to make sure that women were included in federal positions, including cabinet members. And so um, she would very often recommend people to her husband. I, I, you know, this person should be here. This woman should be there. And most of the time he did it. He was pretty good about giving Eleanor what she wanted. Uh, Why not? She's going to do it anyway and find a way to get it done. So might as well just do the easy thing and, and give her what she wants. So during the Depression, um, people started writing to Eleanor. It was mostly children. Children, more than more than anybody, um, started writing to Eleanor Roosevelt. And in the first year, um, the children of the Depression sent her 300,000 letters. And you can read the ones here. And I typed it in there exactly like the kid wrote it. So there's a lot of misspellings and stuff. But mostly they're asking for clothes or um a little bit of money to get clothes and of course Eleanor can't she can't give all these kids everything that they want but she does do something that no other first lady had ever done and that is she wrote every single one of them back she read every letter and wrote every single one of them back now did she write it with her hand she had helpers yes but she heard every letter if it would they would take a group of women that were like her her own little cabinet and at the end of every week um they would sit sit in this room all day and read letters and they would read them out loud and Eleanor would tell them hey this is what I want you to say to them so she heard every letter and every kid got a response that is amazing if you ask me what one what person would you go back in time and spend the day with if you could only have one person mine would be Eleanor this this woman was just unbelievably clever and kind and just just she was like mother to the world and I just I I can't praise her enough she was just an amazing amazing woman so let's talk about minorities what are happening happening to them so of course we talked about they are included in in works programs like the ccc Um, they are given government positions mostly because um, eleanor is pushing for that and they became known as the black cabinet and they were very often brought together um, as just the black cabinet so that they could talk about race issues and what could we do to make things better and that fdr is open to all of that it's not just eleanor he's a allowing that to happen and thinks that that is a really good idea. Uh, Many of them will learn to read and write through the WPA because a lot of those people I told you were artists and and, um, um, musicians. Some of them are teachers. They didn't know anything else to do but to teach. So I told you this is kind of like that. It's a quirky little group of people that we're just going to put them uh, wherever we can best fit them. And so they did have uh, places that you could go to WPA workers and learn to read and write. Uh, They also created a uh, resettlement administration, which is going to end sharecropping forever, and it's going to give loans just to black farmers so that they can own their own land for the first time ever. So sharecropping is made illegal through the RA, and people will start getting loans to have their own um, farms. Now let's talk about the Indians. The Dawes Act is officially repealed. Remember that Dawes Act said that you could not live as a community anymore. You had to live on separate little farms with nothing but your immediate family. That's going to be repealed. Now the damage has already been done. 
but at least it was it was an act done in good faith to repeal that terrible Dawes Act that destroyed their cultures. That was it was just an action of good faith on FDR's part. They finally do start receiving government fund to save their culture. So they started um, using money to open open schools and have teachers that could actually really truly bring that dead dying culture back to life through education so sometimes it was government funding for schools and to find people and pay them to bring that culture back to life all right, so let's look at the New Deal impact and legacy. In the short term, it provides immediate relief, of course, and it does make us feel better about what's happening in the United States. It's still unstable, but we feel better that we have a leader that, that knows it's unstable and that he's he's there to help us. Uh, I do want you to know absolutely that the New Deal, it, do, it floats us. It gives us hope more than anything, H-O-P-E, hope. It does not end the Great Depression. World War II is what does that. But I, I really truly think if we had not had the strength of FDR and, and Eleanor as well, that the, the United States would not have come out of this depression um, at all, even with World War II. I think that, that we would have just fallen by the wayside. So the New Deal keeps us, keeps us afloat gives us hope until World War II uh, comes along. So I do, before we move into the uh, long the long term, I want to uh, kind of tell you something that I think I forgot to tell you along the way. And I, in my mind, it's very important. So you know how Herbert Hoover was a horrible president and he was given such a bad rap for the things that he did and things he didn't do during the first uh, part of the Great Depression. Once he... Um, I think maybe it was even when he was, you know, booed and, and all that rotten food was thrown at him at the baseball game. I think it finally, finally sunk in that there is a problem and, and America is furious. And so he started making all these plans for relief. How do I, how do I help each little group in society? But the true sad, the sad truth of it is he couldn't, give any of these ideas to the American people. They hated him so badly that nothing he said or did would have been accepted. They would have booed it and found something wrong with it. So he started stockpiling these ideas for different acts and organizations. And when FDR became president, he would call FDR secretly. The two of them would talk and he would give FDR a lot of a lot of ideas. And he understood that FDR could not attach his name to it. It's not like FDR was trying to steal something from Hoover. They both knew Hoover's name could not be on it. But a lot of the New Deal stuff, even the alphabet soup stuff, probably probably well actually was hoover's ideas a lot of it was hoover's ideas there's no way we're ever going to know which was fdr and which was hoover but hoover did realize at the last minute and did help so i don't want you to think he was a complete idiot um, he was just an idiot at the time but he did realize that he had done done the united states wrong and was trying to make up for it and we didn't find that out until years later i think it might even have been an eleanor's autobiography which was written written after fdr died and so we don't find out about this for for quite a while all right so that being said make sure you know hoover tried to help let's look at long term um, long term is the big one is the government is now seen as responsible to the needy so for the first time our government is responsible for all of us individually if we were in need the government better come a running so that sounded great in the beginning and it's still a good thing in many situations we have just let it let it get uh too out of hand so there you go. There's the Great Depression. I wish we had an entire school year to talk about the Depression, but we don't, um, sadly. So we are going to move on to World War II. So hold on. It's going to be a long ride, but I think you'll think it's really interesting. So all that being said, we are now on to the reason that we got out of the Great Depression, and that is World War II. So I know you've heard all this before, but we're going to add some extra detail for you. I hope you think it's interesting. So still in Unit 16, um, this is the last thing that we will talk about in Unit 16, 1890 to 1945. So let's get started. 
so of course between the two great wars we have this rise of fascist leaders um, all over Europe and of course fascist just simply means that that there's one guy in charge and he doesn't answer to anybody it is a term that was created by Mussolini um, and it, it basically is the same thing as a dictator or even a divine right ruler they're not asking anybody for advice they are the guy in charge so Mussolini is um, in charge of, of Italy Hitler in, in charge of Germany you know those two guys well we're not going through them again but let's look at Franco Franco was actually um, fighting a war himself in Spain for leadership and Mussolini and Hitler are going to jump in and help Franco win this war and become the leader of Spain and instantly he removes all the civil rights of his people he outlaws any religion but Catholicism he creates a uh, like a spy network to seek out people who might want to bring him down and had over 26,000 people arrested uh, and put in jail many of them will die there and uh, when it came time to actually fight in the war Franco owed Mussolini and Hitler now he never officially got into the war like never signed a document saying I'm at war with anybody but he did send 50,000 people in to help Mussolini and Hitler's men fight so Spain was actually part of the war just not in an official capacity and then of course we have Japan with Hirohito being the emperor and Tojo being the guy that really was running the show as the um, head of the military but really truly the head of the country just nobody really knew that and what are we doing um, or what is what is Europe doing every time that uh, Hitler is doing one more bad thing nothing they're appeasing him you've learned this before so appease him like he's a spoiled little child give him one more piece of land to shut him up and then he gets noisy again and you give him another piece of land and before you knew it he had half of Europe and when he took over Poland in 1939 that was finally it so the invasion of Poland ends that appeasement and the world is at war for a second time so America of course is looking at the entire world in 1939 with an isolationist perspective uh, we do not want to get involved in anybody else's problems it's not that far since the end of World War One in 1918 we remember it very well most of us have family members that fought in it if not you know fighting it ourselves we do not want to go back to war and so we're pretending that nothing is wrong and we're turning a blind eye now there are things happening in Europe you got to know that there are things happening in Europe we just chose to ignore them and the first one of course that is a major concern is France Falls in 1940 and then the Battle of Britain in 1941 40 to 41 boom 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 here you go major powers being invaded and attacked uh, we'll talk more about the Battle of Britain in a minute and then America is finally finally gonna say uh, we've got to get involved and so FDR is a pretty smart president and he knows that if we don't get involved in this war we're not going to get any spoils of the war, war we have to get in this war you can't be a big dog and say no thank you to war you have to be in it and so he's going to find a way to kind of make baby steps towards that involvement let's dip our toes in it he knows that France and Britain both need help. Uh, Britain, with the Battle of Britain, they they're gonna they won that, but they are devastated. I mean, just their you know buildings left and right were were uh, demolished, and they need help. And so uh, FDR creates something called the Lend Lease Act, and he used a fireside chat to announce it to Americans that we were going to lend or lease military equipment and supplies to these European powers that needed our help and he said in that fireside chat you know he was so good at making people feel like like um, he was one of them and he was just taking care of people we talked about that um, in the lend lease act he said to Americans I want you to think of this as lending a garden hose to your neighbor when his house is on fire so how can you say no to that FDR is brilliant and so America said yes and we finally got our first little little toe there a little pinky toe in this great war 
And of course, we have some concerns in Asia as well. Um, China had been uh, invaded by Japan in 1937, so two years between before the war even starts, and they were doing horrible things there. You should know the story of the rape of Nanjing and the comfort zones and some of the other horrible things that Tojo um, either ordered or allowed once he saw it happening just terrible horrible things and so china is is desperate they come to america ask us for help and we asked the japanese to leave and the japanese said no and so fdr said you know what we are 90 percent of all your oil imports you're not getting any more and so we put an embargo on all oil and steel going into into japan and of course, we're also going to uh, seize or freeze ap uh, Japanese assets in American banks in 1941. So the Japanese are, are instantly desperate and they want us to be punished for what happened. Imagine, imagine the United States being told no more oil for you. That means you can't make gas. Anything that, that runs on gas, you can't use it anymore. There would be instant chaos, people killing each other in the streets and doing whatever they could to hold on to that normal life that they love so much and so the Japanese are furious that the United States would do this and they actually gave us an ultimatum in September of 1941 and here's parts of it they gave us an ultimatum uh, stop aiding the Chinese basically but out of everything in the Pacific you need to have a very limited presence we don't want you telling us what to do or getting involved in what's happening in Japan or China you will resume normal trade and remove the embargo and you have a December deadline to make all this happen. So very often you will hear um, the speech that FDR gave after this next event. You know what it's going to be, right? Harbor. After this event, he says, you know, we we were in talks with Japan and everything was good and we were surprised and, and you know, we didn't know we were going to be attacked. Come on, man, you took their oil and their steel away. Of course you know you're going to be attacked. And, the, and Japan gave you an ultimatum. They gave you three months to decide what you were going to do before they struck. So here we are in Pearl Harbor, 12-7-1941, a day that will live in infamy. That's what FDR said. Make sure you don't get mixed up between uh, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. That's talking about the Depression and a day that will live in infamy, which is talking about Pearl Harbor. So there is a devastating loss of men and supplies. We lost tons of stuff, but what was the saving grace that day? Hopefully you remember this. There was something missing that day at port at Pearl Harbor. It was the aircraft carriers, aircraft carriers. Now, listen to this. Okay, you know, I love conspiracy theories. You don't have to agree with me, but you have to listen because you are my captive audience. So I'm going to give you something to think about. Sundays back then were still a day of rest. Okay, so um, Tojo had planned on doing this thing at Pearl Harbor. He's the one that planned it, and he he thought it out very well. We'll do it at Sunday. It's a day of rest. All the military stuff, including the aircraft carriers, will be docked at port. It's a day of rest. You don't do military maneuvers on a Sunday back then. Also, military men tend to drink on Saturday night. And so on Sunday morning, if we do it early, they'll be hungover, they'll be asleep. Maybe they're not at their post yet because they're running late. So Sunday is the perfect day. That's what we're going to do. But then they blow up Pearl Harbor. And guess what? There are no aircraft carriers there. They were all out on maneuvers on a Sunday, on a Sunday. Did we know that they were coming? I think that we knew that they were com they were coming. FDR needs us in this war. America keeps saying no to it. So, you know, sacrifice a couple thousand men and suddenly we're in the war and we can be a big dog again. Um, presidents have done worse than that. So I truly believe that we already knew. On top of Pearl Harbor, and you may not know this because we don't really talk about it that much, but Singapore, Guam, and the Philippines were also t attacked and taken by the Japanese. So remember, that's our stuff. We fought long and hard for the Philippines in our minds um, and Guam as well. So 
we're losing land. They've blown up Pearl Harbor, what was supposed to be the most valuable naval base in the Pacific. Um, and so we are ready to just go after the Japanese. And so we declare war on Japan on December 8th, the very next day. It was a unanimous decision. Not a single person in the House or the Senate said no to it. So all of Congress said, yes, we are at war. And of course, it doesn't take very long before Italy and Germany will declare war on the United States. And then we will on them as well. So now we have something to unite us. Americans are going to unite to fight this, this great war, the second great war. And it's not going to be anything like World War I. All right, so we're going to talk about some major battles and campaigns of, the, of World War II. We are not going to be able to hit all of them. I wish that we had time. We don't. Um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and hit the ones that are the pivotal campaigns and battles. So here we go. So let's start with the Battle of Britain. And again, 1940 to 1941. Not super, super long. Um, it, is, uh, it is the Germans who start it. It becomes a German air offensive. And the the uh, plan that Hitler had was Operation Sea Lion to invade England, uh, perform the Blitzkrieg, and take England just like he had France. So he uses the Blitzkrieg on Poland successfully. He uses it on France successfully. And now through Operation Sea Lion, he's going to try and take Britain down as well. So targets are major cities here, London, other, other large cities, um, factories, airfields, anything that had anything to do with the military. But it is going to uh, change when one of the pilots accidentally bombs a, a heavily populated civilian um, neighborhood. He, it was an accident, and at first Hitler was pretty angry that this guy, you know, like didn't follow orders. But when he saw how it demoralized England, everybody was on board with it. Let's let's start targeting civilians, and I mean everybody. It's not just Hitler; it's Hitler's guys that do it first. But everybody starts targeting civilians. We we did some pretty nasty things in the world to unsuspecting innocent people. So I don't want you to think that it is just Hitler. Um, we all we all played that game and we played it very nasty. So the Battle of Britain, a couple things you need to know about it. It is the first air battle ever in the history of the world. They um, Britain, of course, is going to win through the use of radar and the leadership of Winston Churchill, who said we shall never, ever, ever surrender. Um, make sure you know those things. Make sure you know it's the first time that they used radar. Make sure you know it's the first time that um, civilians became a target in war and it's kind of the way of the world now because of that battle of Britain so again it is a, a very decisive British victory uh, there you go battle of Britain war has started so here's some pictures um, so you can see how badly uh, Britain was was devastated St. Paul's Cathedral St. Paul's Cathedral is one of the most uh, beloved cathedrals in in England and it's just it's just demolished and of course we have I love these pictures the German flying shark that would be scary can you imagine being up in the air and you and you look out your window and you see that thing no thank you uh, and then there there are uh, airplane parts that fell out of the sky and sometimes those killed people but they littered everywhere it was everywhere so even if you didn't get a bomb dropped um, on your apartment building or the place you worked or the street you lived on sometimes airplane parts fell out of the sky so we talked about radar you know that that, that uh, the British had that it was a British invention but they also had sound detectors in England and so you could hear planes coming from far away the thought was that um, um, it would give us a little bit more of a heads up and so if the radar did get destroyed at least we would have the sound detectors <laughs> it's just weird weird kind of equipment isn't it 
So many, many people um, were terrified to stay in their homes. Again, you know, once the target became civilians and you had all that stuff flying from the sky, uh, people were scared. So very, very uh, often people decided to abandon their homes and actually live in the subways. And so you see all the people here, they're, the subways are shut down and people are living in them. Look at this, uh, things being blown up trucks flying through the air yeah not a good not a good place to be uh, and these guys are just saying business as usual uh, yes look at all the rubble in the street the, the guy next to me got blown up <laughs> but we still need money come on in and buy our stuff battle of Britain look at the damage incredible more and I love this Christmas Underground in 1940. I mean, you, I mean, people had just they got used to it, you know. By by Christmas, they were used to it. Look at this, right near the London Bridge, which of course is not there anymore, but um, right near the London Bridge. So we're talking places that are um, definitely civilian areas. All the pictures I'm showing you are civilian areas. This is where people are stopping to eat lunch and grocery shop and shop for shoes and you know right near London Bridge. Now I hope you know a little bit of the backstory of um, the invasion of Poland. You know that it is what led to World War II but but let me give you a little bit of backstory just in case you don't remember it from uh, previous history classes. So uh, Poland had a lot to offer that both the uh, Russians wanted and the Germans wanted in the way of mineral deposits. And so Hitler and Stalin did not trust one another, did not like one another, both recognized the other as a powerhouse, both understood that, that each wanted Poland, and so they decided to work together this one time and invade Poland with Russia coming in from the east and Germany from the west and they would divide Poland in half. Now again they do not trust each other they do not like each other so when they invaded Poland or prior to invading Poland I should say um, they made some made a pact with one another not to invade each other's countries not to go after one another even if war was declared because of this invasion of Poland. They were well aware that it could lead to a, another world war and they were both willing to do it anyway, but they made this Nazi-Soviet non-aggression pact. In other words, they will not be aggressive towards one another, not invade each other's land. So it's formally known as the Nazi-Soviet non-aggression pact. And um, that was supposed to keep the peace between the two countries. So they may it may have worked uh i think that stalin probably would not have ever broken that that pact um but now that hitler has lost in britain he's got to prove himself to to himself and to his people more importantly and so he turns his eye to russia and he is going to actually invade russia so the German invasion of the Soviet Union, um, it is well known as Operation Barbarossa. In some sources, you might hear it as Operation Blue. Um, at one point, it was call, called Operation Fritz. Um, but its official name, if you were talking to a German, is Operation Barbarossa. Sounds ferocious, doesn't it? Um, Barbarossa! And if you remember the history of the Germans, Barbarossa was a pretty nasty leader of Germany many years back in one of the original ones that said we need to be a military powerhouse so Hitler is naming this battle after that that great warrior who was a pretty nasty guy so the invasion was supposed to be a three-prong attack they started in June of 1941 and the plan was that um, for the next six months they would march in in a three-prong attack to major cities in Russia and take them down so we're talking Leningrad Moscow Kiev and take them all down and every time they turn around they the Germans think okay we have taken as many Russians as we need to to move a little bit further ahead um, suddenly there would be more Russians it was like the Russians there was no end to them um, and Hitler had no idea how many men that Stalin was willing to bring 
to the the western side of Russia to keep the Germans from invading. He he really didn't think that it was going to be that big of a deal. He thought that he could pretty easily take over the western portion of Russia. He knew that he had better equipment. The Russian Russians had equipment, but it was very outdated. What Hitler didn't realize is the number of men that Stalin had at the ready. And so at every turn, the Soviets will chase the Germans um, back or hold that hold the line and not let them move forward. And of course, I hope you know from previous history classes that it will all culminate in a very deadly battle called Stalingrad later but right now that the tip of the iceberg the the original invasion the Operation Barbarossa is what we're talking about so June of 1941 to December of 1941 major failure major failure Hitler should have stopped there but of course he's not going to and this will lead to that battle of Stalingrad later we're not ready for that yet there's some other things that are happening between this original invasion and the um, battle at Stalingrad so we'll come back to Stalingrad later. All right, so let's talk about the Philippines. We've got the, that horrible disaster for, for the poor Germans um, in Stalingrad, but we, Japan is not doing so bad. Japan is actually going to take over the Philippines um, after a battle with us from December of 41 to uh, April of 1942. And when the Japanese got there, they they really thought that they were going to have quite a fight on their hands. But 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 it ends up being, as you see here, the worst defeat in in American history because when the Japanese were sent to the Philippines, they like I said, they didn't have very many men to go, and so the best of the best were sent in the hope that they would possibly be able to win. So you've got the best Japanese soldiers you can find going to the Philippines, but the American soldiers and the Filipino soldiers that were were there, they were large in number. But most of them knew nothing about fighting. And so you've got these very new recruits that are kind of the blind leading the blind. And it was an absolute unconditional surrender just to, to the Japanese. Like, we can't fight you. Take us. And so they do. And it becomes... Um, a very very horrible thing for the people that they captured they decided that there were too many prisoners the Japanese did and so they decided that they would weed out the weak by walking them to death that walk becomes known as the Bataan Death March and it starts in April of 1942 uh, MacArthur knew that that these people, these Japanese, were moving through the Philippines, collecting prisoners as they go. And MacArthur was was on that island, and he did not want to leave. He wanted to stay and help his men, and he was ordered by the President of the United States to leave. Um, MacArthur was furious. He did not want to leave his men behind, but but he was forced to leave by his men, too. His men felt like he needed to survive to go on and do uh bigger and better things so MacArthur does leave right before they are taken over um, 775,000 men you see this are marched 65 miles um, only 54,000 are alive at the end and then they are placed into a camp uh, called Camp O'Donnell by the time that that camp is is uh, liberated, only 26,000 of those men are left. So it was a brutal, horrible event. Um, that, and just, just to show you, the Japanese, they meant business, man. They meant business. And here's some of the pictures of the guys marching. So you march nonstop. Um, they would do things like mess with your mind, like offer you a drink of water. And as you're reaching out for it, right before you get it, they would pour it on the ground, not give you water for days, march you day and night. The Japanese would take turns sleeping and then they would catch up catch up to the group um, but they didn't let the walkers sleep you just walked and walked and walked and walked um, and if you fell over you were shot in the head so you didn't want to fall down or get too tired because it meant instant death and you can see these are the guys that were liberated from the camp at the end 26,000 of them left that's it all right, so let's move on to another battle. It always disturbs me to see those pictures. So the Battle of, Cor of Coral Sea was in May of 1942. 
and it was America um, joining forces with Australia against Japan. And as you can see in front of you, in front of you here, it's the first carrier uh, versus carrier battle. And it is the very first time that the Allies stopped the advances of the Japanese. The Allies um, had had really been run over by the Japanese, um, especially in Indonesia. Indonesia was an American and British stronghold, and we really thought that there would be no way absolutely for um, the Japanese to, to plow through there, but they did. They just plowed right through us and uh, was well on the way to taking over Australia. And then, thankfully, thankfully for us, the Japanese ran out of oil. They ran out of oil, which means they ran out of gas, and they were truly, literally sitting dead in the water. So while we have a bunch of uh, military going against the Japanese in the in the at Coral Bay and the Japanese running out of gas literally right before they took over Australia, they there was another battle taking place not very uh, far from this one just a month later at the, called the Battle of Midway. And if you remember, Pearl Harbor um, supposedly happened because we could not break the Japanese code. But in June of 1942, a man who did finally break the Japanese code, uh, Chester Nimitz, there's a lot of ships named after him, the USS Nimitz. Chester Nimitz broke the code in time to find out that the Japanese were planning on taking the battle, or planning on taking the island of Midway. And so basically the Americans just sat on the far side of the island, hidden. And when the Japanese came around the corner, they opened fire and pretty much demolished them. So Japan had um, six carriers that day, aircraft carriers, and they ended up losing four of them. We lost one, but it wasn't enough to really uh, demolish our fleet. Uh, Japan had six carriers that were still, or, or had six carriers, sorry, only four of them still had gas, and they lost all four. So this is a major blow, a major turning point against um, the Japanese, and the Japanese will never recover from this. This is really their last hurrah. Um, after this, they do not have enough boats or planes with gas to really do anything uh, to cause any damage. And this is where you start getting the kamikaze pilots after after the Coral Sea battle and Midway and, and them running out of gas and losing their carriers. They are going to end up having to do uh, whatever it takes to blow up whatever they can blow up. And you get the first kamikaze pilots. We don't have enough gas for you to go out and come back. So we'll just turn the plane into a weapon. So they are definitely becoming desperate um, after the Battle of Midway, and it will end up being more hand-to-hand -hand combat after that as far as the Japanese side of it. So make sure you know it as, a, as the major turning point against Japan in the Pacific, the Mad Battle of Midway. All right, so we, we mentioned this before, the invasion of the of Russia by the Germans. It's, it was the plan was called Operation Barbarossa, and of course the Germans are going to end up being stuck in the city of Stalingrad. That's where uh, the, the major, major brutality is going to take place between 1942 and 1943. So they're there for um, about seven months, uh, this major battle. It is the bloodiest battle in history with about two two million deaths but we are still finding bodies even today so today the count is about 840,000 Germans dead 100,000 made prisoners of war and over a million Soviets but they are still finding bodies so that count is not accurate um, we're guessing that it's probably more along around 2 million if not more than that and again they 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 find bodies constantly, uh, large groups of bodies, and they dig them up and they have a ceremony for them and they rebury them. Of course, they don't know who they are, but they rebury them um, with honors. And so they kind of do like this nighttime vigil where they light these candles and they hold this ceremony and then they, they count the bodies and try to figure out if they can who any of them are, but they weren't big on dog tags yet. Um, not in Russia and Germany. So a lot of these men will be reburied with no one ever knowing who they were, but it gives us a better body count. Um, so the Battle of Stalingrad, again, there were 100,000 uh, Germans that were taken as prisoners and made prisoners of war. 
These guys will not um, be allowed to come home even after the war is over. They're not released until about 10 years after the war is over. They're kept in, in a POW camp in Russia. And by the time that they are released, there are only 5,000 of them left. And there is no really uh, good account of what happened to those men in that prison. There was only one book ever written. And no, I can't remember the name of it. Um, but he was... Uh, he was not quite a a whole person by the time he came out of the camp so we don't know how much of it is real and how much of it was um like this fever dream so uh one account out of those 5,000 men. So what the heck happened to those Germans in that POW camp, that Russian POW camp? We don't know. Um but obviously it was very horrific. So make sure you know the Battle of Stalingrad as a very decisive Soviet victory, um, even though they lost even more men than the Germans did. And it is that major turning point against the Germans. The Germans will never recover. Hitler's reputation will never recover after the Battle of Stalingrad. I mean, basically, it was a trick. Um, they had invaded Russia it lost every single little mini battle they get held up in Stalingrad and everyone is telling Hitler give up give up give up and he's screaming no no retreat no surrender and he loses 840,000 Germans uh, I mean he, he how do you recover from a reputation like that you don't so this is his his turn personal turning point as well as a major turning point against the Germans in general now, at the same time that the Russians and the Germans were fighting at Stalingrad, the British and the Germans, along with some Italian forces, were fighting in Egypt. Um, and this becomes known as the battle, Battles of El Alamein. There are several battles taking place consecutively. So the Battles of El Alamein. Now, what, what do the Russians want in Egypt? Why in the world are they splitting their forces when they need all the men that they can get in Russia? Um, it's because there are oil fields that in Egypt and the Germans really need the oil there um, not only for themselves but perhaps to give it to the uh, Japanese who are running on fumes so the British will uh, meet the uh, Russian powers in El, in the city of El Alamein and they will stop the German advance there now here's the reason why the guy who was in charge of the German and Italian fleet in Egypt was uh, a, an amazing war guy. Uh, German, uh, he's a German field marshal, Erwin Rommel, often known as the Desert Fox, um, because he was so good and he was really good in places like this where it was desert fighting, flat lands, uh, sand blowing in your face. He was really good at this. But the problem is, Erwin Rommel, who was in charge of all the Germans and all the Italians, was hurt in a previous battle. And by the time that he got to El Alamein um, he was the, he got there late his forces had already been fighting with the British and by the time that he got there his men the Italians and the Germans were not doing well and he had to pull out so he he told his men to save his men we've got to leave well Hitler was not happy about this at all he was furious with Erwin Rommel um, to top it all off when Rommel met with Hitler to tell him, you know, this is why we pulled out, here's what happened, he also happened to mention to Hitler that he did not really agree with what was happening in, happening in the Holocaust camps with the Jews. And Hitler really didn't like that. So um, early in 1944, um, some of Hitler's men showed up at the home of the desert fox Erwin Rommel and said today is your last day on earth uh, Hitler's decided he's had enough now Hitler and Rommel were actually really good friends this guy was like Hitler's right hand man he he trusted him with all these secrets he trusted him to be you know the guy to go to when he needed a battle strategist but I guess losing those oil fields on top of that insult about the the Holocaust camps Hitler had just had it so early in 1944 he, he makes this order go to Rommel's house and kill him um, because they were friends he went to he had these guys show up at Rommel's house and say here's your choice you um, you you can live but we're gonna kill your entire family 
or you can save your save your family and you can come with us and you're not you're never coming home and so that's the favor you're a friend of hitler so here's a favor we're going to give you the choice so rommel told his family that he was leaving and he was never coming back told his wife exactly what was happening kissed her goodbye and uh rommel the next time anybody heard anything about him uh he was found um in in a car by himself with a bullet in his head supposedly it was suicide but we all know now that it was not the desert fox was assassinated by hitler's henchmen uh for his failure at the battle of el alamein so the, the Germans are just losing left and right. They're losing at Stalingrad. They're losing at El Alamein. They're not going to get the oil that they need. And Hitler is disgraced at two, on two fronts, Russia and Egypt. Oh, and his really good friend is now dead at his own hand. So Germany has, Germany has that double whammy in 1942, losing in Russia, losing in Egypt, and by June of 1944, the Americans had decided on a plan to invade France and get uh, get control back. So you've got the British after them in Africa, you've got the Russians after them in Russia, and now you have the Americans after them in at uh, D-Day. So that invasion of Normandy Beach, D-Day, again, make sure you know it's to start... It, freeing the country of France from German control and this begins that slow year almost a year long uh, liberation of German occupied Europe so we start with Norm Normandy uh, one of it is the largest invasion ever planned out and uh, super super successful we lost a lot of men there though that day um, but very very successful in that we pushed the Germans back so invasion of D-Day, make sure that you know that as um, the pivotal moment where there is no coming back for the Germans, June 1944, and we very quickly start getting all of Europe out of uh, German control. All right, so at the same time that that we are invading Normandy or making plans to, uh, we are also making plans on what to do in the Pacific. So we created something the Americans did called the Island Hopping Campaign. And with MacArthur and the help of many others of uh, between 43 and 45, we figured out which islands we would need in order to invade Japan. Uh, so you're hopping across the Pacific to get close enough to Japan to invade it. Japan is really hard to to uh, bring ships to port in, especially large ships or fleets of ships. And so we need to be able to get pretty daggone close to Japan so we could fly over them or uh, kind of slowly bring our boats in a few at a time. So they, they picked out the islands that would be strategic. They would also be weak spots for the Japanese and it would get the Americans closer and closer to Japanese soil. I'm sure you've heard of this battle, the Battle of Iwo Jima. Uh, the Battle of Iwo Jima was one of those strategic places that uh, that the Americans had decided to take over. Now, here's the thing. Iwo Jima is this little teeny tiny island that you can stand on one side and see the other side. It's very, very small. There's nothing to see on it. There's only one land mass, a, a small I want to say hill, but it's a little bit bigger than a hill, not quite a mountain, but it's known as Mount Suribachi, and that's it. So when our guys arrived in February of 1945, we think it is abandoned. Um, what we don't know, understand about Iwo Jima is Iwo Jima is really, really important to the Japanese culture. Um, they believe that it is the first island created by their gods that they believe created Japan. And so this is a holy place to them. That's why no one lives there. It's not because it's not livable. It's because it's it's too holy for people to live there. And we've just invaded it. So it is the very first attack on the Japanese home islands. And it is the one that we, we should not have picked. Um, but the Japanese did see it coming. They were prepared. They were hiding in tunnels underneath of the island. Um, and when our Marines walked by, they would could just jump out of the ground, kit, uh, cut their Achilles heel. The guy's not going to be walking anymore. And then they could hide back in the ground. So it was a very, very bloody battle. A lot of hand-to-hand -hand combat. 
It is a purely Marine Corps battle. Everybody there was a Marine, um, and it becomes the bloodiest Marine Corps battle in history. Um, there were 70,000 Marines that went in, almost exactly 35,000 died there. So about half of the Marines that went there uh, did not come home and there were 18,000 Japanese when the Americans landed and only 200 survived. So that should give you a pretty good image of how bloody and how horrible this battle truly was. So the Battle of Iwo Jima first attack on a Japanese home island and it was the holiest of all their islands. Now the last island that America had to get in her island hopping campaign was Okinawa. So that battle will begin in April of 1945 right on the heels of Iwo Jima and that massive loss of life but an American win um, at Iwo Jima. So the, the Americans that landed on Okinawa really thought that it would be like a D-Day reenactment where they would storm the beaches and be basically slaughtered but they weren't the Japanese were were very low on everything including men and they were very worried about about using everything that they had this is their last chance this is the last island before before America can invade Japan they have to be really super careful so they sat back and they waited and they watched and basically they waited too long the leaders the American leaders started a propaganda campaign saying to the Japanese basically lying to them and saying um, your emperor already gave up America has won the battle and a lot of these guys uh, you know to, to die in battle was a great honor so a lot of the Japanese killed themselves uh, more and more of them were willing to be kamikaze pilots to do that one last great thing for their country to die in battle is the greatest thing you can do for your country and so even though uh, we really were outnumbered, we ended up, look at the losses here. America lost 12,000 men versus the Japanese who lost 110,000 men. Uh, that propaganda campaign just really, really messed them up. Um, and I can't talk about the Battle of Okinawa without talking about this guy you see on the screen here. His name is Corporal Desmond Doss. And Desmond Doss was a Seventh-day Adventist, which means that he does not believe in... Um, and carrying a weapon um, and of course going through boot camp he got all kinds of guff for this but he stuck to his faith and said I'm not doing it he was a medic so he wanted to go to help people and he refused to hurt anybody it was against his religion and you know everything that he stood for and so he refused to but the um, at one point in this battle it, it was believed that the Japanese were going to beat us and the uh, commander of Desmond Doss's unit told Desmond and everybody else let's go we're out let's go save ourselves and Desmond wouldn't do it Desmond went back and in into the fray and he rescued by himself 75 of his own men that were laying on the battlefield wounded and couldn't find their way out 75 of them and so of course you know by the time he had brought out a few everybody was was screaming at him come you know come he's on it he's got to like take them over a uh, down a rope off of a, a kind of a cliff and so whenever he shows up on the on the edge of the cliff again over them um, over over all his men the men are screaming you know stop 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 you need to come down you're gonna get killed you don't even have a gun and and he would disappear again and he would go off and a little while later you would see him come back with another man and he'd lower that guy over the edge and everybody would say come on come on and he wouldn't do it until he was he did not give up until he was so physically exhausted that he could no longer walk and he basically fell off the cliff and they caught him and um, rescued him and took him in for medical care but 75 men now here's the guy that everybody said we don't want him on our side he won't even carry a gun and he saved 75 men mostly one at a time uh, going back into the fray and saving them so this is an American win it, again it's the last battle last island that we need in order to invade um, Japan or to get close enough to invade them and of course we're going to end up using Okinawa as a base to fly those planes over to uh, blow Japan up and so uh, a great win for Americans and a uh, really bad loss for the Japanese all right, so we finally get our victory in Europe. You may know it as VE Day. See this lovely picture of the guy holding that? Victory in Europe or victory over Europe. Both are correct. May 8th, 1945. So Hitler is dead 
and uh, he actually died at the end of April so Germany took a couple uh, days to finally say we're out May 8th 1945 victory in Europe so May of 45 the Germans are out but the Japanese are still not willing to surrender so um, Truman was uh, was all for dropping these bombs and a lot of people said um, no we can't but he but he said look you got to weigh the cost of invasion against the use of atomic weapons if we invade Japan we're gonna lose a million American lives so he said dropping these bombs yes it's gonna kill innocent people but it's gonna save a million American lives and it's gonna save more Japanese lives than it takes because these Japanese are never going to stop fighting we've got to do something this this drastic to make them stop so in July of 1945 America created something called the Potsdam Declaration which basically says to Japan you've got one more chance surrender or we will we will cause utter destruction and that's exactly what they said utter destruction and of course the Japanese are not going to surrender and so we do drop the bomb on, on Hiroshima 8-6-1945 and killed about 150,000 people almost immediately uh, many more will die of um, different uh, cancers and stuff later in between or shortly after Hiroshima Russia finally declares war on Japan Russia had never declared war on anybody um, but now they officially declared war on Japan and then on the 9th of August you've got Nagasaki being bombed and losing 80,000 lives and so Japan will finally surrender in August um, on August 15th 1945 so I do want to tell you real quick Nagasaki by the way was an accident um, we were not supposed to bomb Nagasaki it was that it was a cloudy day and the guys got off target um, that was not actually supposed to be a target it was supposed they were supposed to hit a valley um, that was not uh, as highly populated as Nagasaki was and like I said the guy got off track and so he thought he was in the right valley and he was not and it ended up being Nagasaki that got got uh, destroyed so 80,000 people lost their life over a mistake all right so make sure you know that the reason that Truman gave was that it would save American lives that you know you got to weigh those options it would save American lives we did say you know you've got one last chance to surrender Hirohito and Tojo said no and so we blew up um, these two cities and of course we have victory over Japan the Japanese surrender 8 15 1945 and it's called VJ Day VJ Day so um, September 11th 1945 Tojo tries to kill himself uh, we save him because we want to hang him publicly and that is exactly what we do so uh, American GIs had to actually give this guy blood to save him he had tried to kill himself because that is the warrior Japanese warrior way to die with honor and uh, they we wouldn't let him we said nope we're gonna save you so we can kill you publicly and the picture you see here over on the right hand side is a super famous picture uh, these two do not know each other it was announced in Times Square that the war was over and this guy just grabbed her and, and a photographer was there took the shot and it is probably the most famous picture um, of World War II and no they didn't know each other oh and there it is VJ Day alright so let's talk about what's happening at home when this war is going on okay so same we're still in World War II I'm going I'm gonna backtrack now uh, but now we're gonna see what was happening in America as our guys were over in the Atlantic and Pacific fighting this war what's happening at home so home front issues so the question is did Americans support the war how did they feel about the war so before Pearl Harbor 1939 um, in the year of 1939 many Americans maybe even the majority of Americans were isolationist we did not want to know what was going over in Europe we remember World War one too vividly and we do not want to be involved in another war so America is very much an isolationist place uh, we also had a lot of people that were German supporters there were a lot of Germans in America a lot of Germans and some people felt like the Germans had been picked on during the imperialist period um, they had been picked on with the, um, the Treaty of Versailles that ended World War one and some people were saying we get it we get why the Germans are so mad let them let them have some stuff because we've really treated these guys horribly um, 
but there was also a committee that was created called the America First Committee and it was pretty powerful and they were very anti-war very non we do not want to be involved non-involved um, kind of mentality and famous people were on the American First Committee including Charles Lindbergh remember we talked about Lindbergh and, and his poor baby that was that was killed so a lot of people um, were actually creating organizations to to keep us out of the war but things are going to change once Pearl Harbor, Pearl Harbor happens in 1941. So no more isolationist. Americans are going to unite to fight the war. The America First Committee is dissolved completely overnight. Boom, it's gone. And believe it or not, where we had those German supporters prior to, to Pearl Harbor, um, the German supporters are quiet now, but these same people, some of them are going to turn to blaming the Jews, that the Jews are the reasons that we got pulled into this war. Um, Germany was all upset and hot and bothered because of those daggone Jews. Um, and so now they're going to take their anger out on the rest of the world. If those Jews had just done as they were told, uh, kind of mentality, ridiculous, ridiculous kind of mentality. But you got to have somebody to blame. That's how we all are. And of course, we're going to pick the group that everybody always picks on, the poor Jews. So America really does mobilize overnight and um, FDR created something called the War Production Board with Executive Order 9024 and Executive Order 9024 gave powers to the War Production Board to go to industries across the United States and make them produce certain goods. And so as an industry owner you no longer have the right to make what you want. You will make what the government wants you to make. This is an all out like all, all hands on deck. Everybody has got to take part in this war and so it's not like they were holding in industry leaders captive the industry leaders wanted to do this they wanted to help um, but the war board was in charge of, of who made what so they were very very powerful um, and they they're allowed to set prices they're allowed to, to decide who gets what as far as um, uh, money from the government to help who gets paid what and so war the war board was very 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 powerful uh, one of the things that they promoted com like you wouldn't believe it was on every poster you know everywhere across America everywhere you look there was a poster about buying war bonds and this was also part of the war production board this advertising to get people to buy war bonds so and, and by the time the war is over, 186 billion dollars were uh, paid, were given, was given to the government by private citizens. So in fact, they, the private citizens paid for three quarters of the war, um, our war debt. So war bonds were a big deal. It, it basically was almost like a stock. Um, your belief in, in our uh, ability to win the war kind of stock. And at the end of the war, you were supposed to get your money back with a um, like interest. And of course, you don't. You don't get anything back. Um, but we weren't highly in debt after the war either because America had paid paid the bill. So also on top of this economic mobilization you see uh you see this this mentality of of how awful the nazis are i love the one with the little girl deliver us from evil um buy war bonds so you know like the like the germans are the devil women too this is my fight too so i'm gonna buy war bonds and of course we also have captain america who's the hero of the day i want you to buy war bonds now so um big big deal to buy war bonds everyone bought them it was your american duty rationing was the other big thing of the day everything was rationed so according to your family size you got a coupon book like the one you see up here in the corner you got it in the mail and it delegated to you how much you could have of basically everything and if you ran out of a ticket for milk that month then you just couldn't get any more milk so when you went to the grocery store the grocer got your food for you and for every item that he put on the counter for you to buy he removed the the according uh, ticket the matching ticket to it so everything was rationed but here's the top things you see in front of you coffee meat cheese tires gas clothing you can't buy uh, new tires anywhere during this time period you can only buy retreads and you pair this rationing with this propaganda campaign to get people to uh, to conserve gas so you share uh, share a car today if you don't 
if you don't ride, if you ride alone, you're really riding with Hitler. Crazy, crazy, crazy. Um, and here's the pledge. I love this one. I char, I charge no more than top legal prices. I sell no ration goods without collecting ration stamps. Um, truth is that about a quarter of Americans were buying stuff on the black market uh, above and beyond these little ration books. Um, but it was it was your American duty to save food as much as you possibly could to say so that we could feed our guys over um, overseas. Um, so here's some other things to save tires you have to drive under 35 share your car um, ask yourself is this trip really necessary uh, look at the ladies to dress extravagantly in the wartime is worse than bad form it's unpatriotic so you should not look good you should not dress up and the motto motto began became boy I cannot speak today the motto became use it up wear it out make it do or do without my grandma used to say that to me all the time um, Recycle everything, 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 everything. There is no such thing as waste paper. It needs to be recycled. Old rags, we can turn it into clothes. Uh, scrap metals, we can turn it into uh, into bullets. Don't throw anything away and don't buy anything new was, was the mentality of the day. So make sure you know the phrase, use it up, wear it out, make it do or do without. That was the mot mantra of the time period. Um, so there are companies out there that are trying to help because you can't get anything new on the market, even clothes. Uh, you were supposed to just mend your clothes and keep wearing them. But the problem is that children wear their clothes out and they grow out of them. So there were uh, sugar and flour and feed companies that started making their giant bags of flour and feed and, and sugar um, make them out of pretty patterns so that when you were done using that sack you could turn it into a dress for your for your daughters and they were called flower sack dresses and so again it's a way for everybody to to do their part in the war so Pillsbury you're gonna wear a Pillsbury dress now Pillsbury's trying to help you out um, because because it's owned by good American citizens so these flower sack dresses or feed sack dresses were kind of the rage of the day and you know my mom said she wore these too even past the war and um it was kind of it was the fat of the day you know and it, that was the only new thing it was okay to wear because it was a flower sack or a feed sack dress which meant your mom and dad weren't throwing money around so you finally got something new Every single family had a victory garden. So you see, this is in New York City. You've got the skyscrapers behind you. Um, all the parks were turned into gardens. And you have to feed the men overseas. So if you're eating men here, in, or if eating men, <laughs> don't eat the men. If you're eating American-produced food here in America, that's more food that the guys aren't going to get shipped over to them. So you're supposed to have your garden. You better learn how to can. You better learn how to conserve. Uh, grow your own crap, basically. So victory gardens uh, would win the war. Food would win the war. You heard that quite often. They also uh, started using daylight savings time again. So 1942 for one year. FDR decided that they would use daylight savings time. Well, he said it was going to be one year. He said that it would conserve fuel because it would be, you'd have more light and it would allow more time for people to work in their gardens. But of course, we know that that stupid daylight savings time never went away. So I love this. Uncle Sam, your enemies have been up and are at work at the extra hour of daylight. What, when will you wake up? So, um, it was a, another wartime thing. City yawns as new wartime goes into effect. Victory. Congress passes daylight savings bill. Get your hoe ready. It's all about the farmers. I wish that they would take this away. I hate daylight savings time. But make sure you know that that was a World War II in, uh, thing. Um, not invention, but a thing. And it was, it, like I said, it was okayed by FDR, but it was only supposed to be for a year. Take it away. Take it away. All right, so let's see what was happening with minorities during the war. So we're going to have Japanese, we're going to have Navajo, uh, we're going to have um, um, women, we're going to have African Americans. Let's see what all of these different groups are doing in the war and how they're playing their part. 
let's start with the Japanese. So of course, because we are fighting Japan in the war, there is intense racism, um, accusations of sabotage. California fired all Japanese American state workers, and it was legal to do that. Um, the guys who were going into um, into the tr into the military were not being treated very well. If you were a Japanese man, and you know Americans are dumb about Japanese, so really we're talking about any Asian military person if you were Asian they took your guns away from you and basically turned you into uh, people who cleaned so you were you were demoted you were made fun of you were threatened constantly um, but FDR I gotta give him this FDR said you know here's men that are valuable they've been trained to be soldiers and we're not letting them so he he decided the FDR decided that he was going to form a regiment that was nothing but uh, Japanese soldiers, and they become the Nisei Nisei regiments. Um, most people just call them the NIS or the NIS, um, but it's Nisei, and they will form the 442nd Regimental Combat Team. So of course their officers are all going to be white. But these guys really wanted to prove to America that they were good American citizens. And so these men are willing to do just about anything in battle um, to prove that to America. And they, they so many of them were hurt uh, bravely, uh, did really brave things and got themselves hurt. And so many of them got awards and medals and the Purple Heart that they became known as the Purple Heart Battalion. And by the end of the war, the Nisei Regiment, the 442nd, was the most decorated regiment in the world in any war. So, yes, they fought valiantly. Did America stand up and say, oh my gosh, we were wrong. These guys are wonderful. Of course not. Really? Did you really think that was going to be the way it was? Of course not. But these men were very, very brave and very, very um, good at proving their American citizenship and their loyalty and their patri patriotism. And so how do we pay them back for such bravery? We create the Japanese internment camps. Uh, FDR says that he believes that these people need to be protected, that, that too many people in society, white society, black society, um, were upset at the Japanese or anybody Asian. And so for their protection, he created the Executive Order 9066 that made it legal to round up all Japanese. And again, you know, it's really going to be all Asians, period, and put them in internment camps. So in the summer of 1942, 110,000 Japanese and other Asians were uh, dispersed to 10 different internment camps, mostly in the West. Um, there is an individual that says this is against this is against my rights as an American citizen, and his name is Korematsu, and so he's going to sue the United States government for putting him in a prison because he didn't do anything to be put into a prison. But uh, the Korematsu versus the United States uh, saw Korematsu losing the case. It was upheld by the Supreme Court. So now you have the president giving the order. Congress passed it. You've got the judiciary branch saying we're going to uphold it. These poor people had no, no recourse. They were just going to stay in prison. And they end up there for three years. It's 1942. The war is not over till 45. So these people are, are left in prison until... Uh, for three years all their belongings were sold immediately um, you had 24 hours in most cases to uh, to have all your little loose ends tied up your house sold your business sold your car sold if you didn't sell it the government would confiscate it and sell it themselves and take the money to help fight the war even at the end of three years you they didn't just open the gate and say okay you can go each each person had to be given a loyalty review and then if you passed it you could leave so uh, we're not really sure what all was in that uh, loyalty review it's not like a test or something that they published it was an interrogation is what it was so let's look at what some of these camps look like um, well here's where they are so you again you've got them all in the west and then you have those those two very small ones um in arkansas but mostly in the west the biggest ones of course will be in california but there's 10 there's 10 total um in uh 
I'm counting here to make sure that there are 10 dots. I think there are. All right, so there's 10. You don't have to know where they are, but know the biggest ones are in California and there's 10. So this is what it looked like. And I, you know this picture, I'm not really sure why they all look happy, um, but they do. Look at them all waving and smiling. So here's the thing that I want to make sure that you understand about the internment camps. What It was absolutely wrong to put these people in prison simply because of, of their ethnicity. But there is a lot to the idea that they needed protection from our government. And if you have them all in one place, you can protect them. Yes, true. Um, the fact that they took all their belongings, you can't get over that. But I want to make sure that you do not compare this to the Holocaust. This is not a Holocaust episode. Nobody's being beaten or starved or shot in the head. Um, it is it is not comparable at all to what was happening in the Jewish Holocaust camps. So just know that. Is, is Does that make it right? No, absolutely not. It does not make it right. But I, I just don't want you to think that we went that far overboard. Just putting them in the camps alone was overboard enough. So they do live in a barrack style. Um, this is everybody eating together. So you ate and you slept and you lived with hundreds and hundreds of people in, in a barracks style um, home. So you lose your individuality, you lose your family unit. Um, men suddenly didn't have a place in society. Now when they when they first went into these internment camps, uh, it was a very distinct family unit with father being the guy who, who you know, is the, makes all the laws in the family. The wife is the one who makes sure they get carried out. The kids are very polite. They do their duties. They're, they, they are very respectful to their parents. In this atmosphere where you're living like this for three years and you can't keep it clean, you can't keep track of your kids, your husband doesn't have a job anymore, so why should he be able to tell you what to do? They really lose their culture. Um, in the door, women were inferior, and they walk three steps behind any male figure, but now they're not inferior. They're actually the only ones doing anything because they're the ones growing food. The men aren't doing anything. The women are cleaning, raising the kids, growing the food, and so their, their li lifestyles and their culture is completely destroyed by this communal living. And there you go. There's the barracks from the outside. Um, we, like I said, we were just dumb about, about their culture. It wasn't like we were targeting to destroy that relationship between men and women in the Japanese culture, but we did. And there you have more of them hanging out in their barracks. There you go, trying to make a little bit of a home, a little bit of privacy, but there's no, there's none to be had, and that's their life. It's not just the Japanese that are finding their lives completely different. It is also very different for women in the United States. Women, for the first time in droves, are turning to factory work. Um, we've talked about women in textiles and stuff before, but this is different. This is women going in and doing the job of men in the factories that normally were dominated by men. Now they're not going to make as much money so the, the guys who own the companies actually liked this. Um, I'm saving money and I'm, I'm you know wartime production is good so everybody's happy. Uh, they were making tons of money. Now women it will change their lives forever. In World War One, they understood, they went in the door of the factories knowing that it was a very temporary kind of thing. But now it's not. Uh, women, women really truly believe in their ability and their potential for the first time and the fact that they do not have to have a man. Uh, daycare is a brand new idea. Eleanor Roosevelt actually opened up several daycares, especially for black women, so that they could leave their children and it was federally funded and these women could go and go off and go to work. So 37% of all women um, by 1944, by 1944, 37% of all women in America worked outside the outside outside of the home, which is an astronomical number uh, compared to any years prior to that. And again, it's different than World War One. When the war is over, men are going to come home and expect the ladies to just quietly scamper off and go back to the kitchen and be impregnant. And of course, the women are going to say no. 75% refuse to leave their jobs after the war. It's going to be a huge fight between the men and the women and who gets to keep the job.
So let's look at a difference between a World War I factory girl and a World War II factory girl. So look at the World War I one. She's, she's in the upper corner on the left hand side. She's wearing her little beanie and her hair is still curled and she's got her white high heel boots on and she's sitting there polishing parts that are going to go onto the plane. She's so sweet, so cute. Now look at the World War II girls. They're actually building planes. They're not just cleaning them and polishing them. They're building them. So World War I girl, you come home with dirt under your fingernails, you're a disgrace. World War II chicks, you don't come home with dirt under your fingernails, you're a disgrace. So two very, very different ways of looking at women in the war effort. All right, so let's look at what women were actually doing like really truly in the war there was something called the wax the women's army corps and there were 150,000 of these ladies they were known as the skirted soldiers I love it this is the first time that women will serve in the military not as nurses so you see Dwight D Eisenhower you gotta love this guy Dwight D Eisenhower I love this the simple headquarters of Grant or Lee are gone forever Stop being old-fashioned. An army of filing clerks, stenographers, office managers, telephone operators, and chauffeurs are essential, and it's scarcely less than criminal to recruit them from needed manpower when great numbers of highly qualified women were available. So he's saying, let's get the ladies out there. Let's give them all these jobs. Why, why would we pull from our military, the active military, the guys out there defending us, and, and make them be secretaries? Let's let our, our ladies do it. They want to. And so the Women's Army Corps is a little bit deceptive in that it says Corps, so you think they're actually out there fighting. They're not. They're, they are helping. They're all the little helper jobs that you can think of. Um, but, but that was a huge step for women. Women only ever really got to play a part if they were nursing men who got hurt during the war. And this is something totally different. They're actually helping. So the wax were a big deal and 150,000 women will join the wax. Now even more impressive are the wasps. I know they, these are really hard to say sometimes. Uh, women Air Force service pilots. So they actually allowed women to fly. Now, are they going to fly in combat? No, but they are going to deliver goods back and forth. They were highly respected, very highly trained, and to be a wasp was like the coolest thing ever. People really respected the wasp. So you can be a, a whack, or you can be a wasp, or you can work in a factory. But everybody's going to be doing something. Let's make that clear. Everyone will be doing something. Everybody plays their part. All right, African Americans, the message of fighting tyranny really inspired blacks. Um, so they very willingly went ahead and, and signed up. Nobody was forcing them to sign up. And they created something called the Double V Campaign. In their mind, they would have a double victory if they, if they won this war. We'd have, we would have a victory in Europe, and you would have a victory against racism at home. So a Double V Campaign death to racism at home and winning against the enemy in Europe. So many pictures that you see in this time period of African Americans, you'll see them holding up a, a double V with their fingers. And that's what it means, the double V program. So the NAACP is going to become more powerful than ever during this period. Um, the sad thing is, though, these guys are going to fight very valiantly, too, just like the, the Nisei did, but there's no effort at all to integrate the armed forces. FDR said that this was not the time, that he didn't need that kind of stress on the troops. It was best to just keep them separate. But he did allow a, um, a troop of men to be trained as black pilots. Now, they were going to they were going to be um, not the, the guys really, uh, how do I say this? Like they weren't the bombers. They weren't going to be the bombers that dropped their the target on a specific or dropped the bomb on a specific target. They were going to be the escorts. So they were supposed to train to escort this bomber plane to safely drop its target. And they decided that they would allow, um, allow them to be trained as pilots in Tuskegee. And you've heard that name before, Tuskegee Institute. Remember that? Um, same same town. So the Tuskegee Airmen are going to be trained. They are an incredibly intelligent group of men. Um, they were from from many different uh, 
types of, of work. There were doctors, there were dentists, there were lawyers, there were architects. Um, they were an absolutely amazingly intelligent group and they are going to do uh, very, very well in boot camp, uh, in the Tuskegee boot camp. Now, of course, they're run by white officers. So the problem is that they're highly trained, they're highly intelligent, and nobody's letting them actually fly. They're still tus stuck in Tuskegee. They've been trained, they've all passed it, but they're still stuck in Tuskegee. So they gave them all a test um, to, to see if they were, you know, uh, trained well enough to actually leave Tuskegee and and it's a written test though I don't I'm, I'm imagining what might have been on that test who knows what was on it but anyway the men did so well on the test they were absolutely convinced that these guys cheated the military was so they made them take the test again and the second time around they of course had they were highly monitored and everybody staring at them waiting for somebody to look at somebody else's paper and even under all that strain and stress they y'all did better the second time around so these guys were ready to go and no one is letting them and enter Eleanor you have to love this woman she heard that the Tuskegee men were trained they had passed the test twice uh, they passed all the flying tests they were supposed to be like really good at what they did but yet they're still in Tuskegee not going to the war so she shows up at Tuskegee and she says to the, of course, white man in charge, it was all whites in charge, um, I would like to go up in a plane today. I want to fly in one of your planes. And he said, yes, ma'am, um, let's, let's go and, and, and get you in a plane. And he calls to a pilot, you know, like, like gives him a signal, you're going to take Miss Roosevelt up. And she said, and it was a white guy. And she said, no, 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 I don't want to go up with him. I want to go up with him and she pointed at one of the, Tus the Tuskegee black guys so of course they're all a fluster because for one thing you're not supposed to have a white woman and a black man alone but you're gonna let the president's wife go up in a plane with a black man oh my god the world is going to end these guys were freaking out and she said I'm the president's wife I can do anything I want to do so this is them getting ready to take off she goes up with him they have a wonderful flight um, she lands she has had an, an amazing time and she gets out of the plane and she says to the white commanding officer these men will be shipped out tomorrow morning and he said no ma'am they won't and she said then I will make sure that every paper in the United States tomorrow morning has an article about how we have trained these men and spent thousands and thousands and thousands of US citizens money to train them and they're sitting here doing nothing because you're afraid for them to go to Europe and she said do you want them to believe that you don't want black men to die in battle I mean she just like tore him a new one everything that she could think of well by golly the next morning you know what happened these guys are going to be sent to Europe now at first they did face a lot of, of discrimination no one wanted them to be their bomber escorts um, but I mean they had they got assignments they had to they're there Roosevelt's are watching they have to make them actually go up in the sky and so after a while people begin to realize that how good these guys are and in the end by the end of the war people were begging please let us have the Tuskegee guys we want them to escort us and do you know that those Tuskegee airmen never lost a single bomber some of them got killed and lost their life as the escorts to that bomber but they never lost a single one so you want to talk about amazing that would be the Tuskegee airmen all right, and the last group we're going to talk about are the American Indians. Uh, the United States Marines uh, searched high and low for a code that could not be broken. Uh, they wanted to make sure that the Germans and the Japanese had no idea what was happening. And so somebody came up with the idea of using the Navajo language. It is considered one of the most difficult languages that ever has existed. And so they go to the Navajo and ask them, would you be our code talkers? And the Navajo, we had killed their culture um, almost completely. And so the Navajo guys had to actually relearn their natural language or their native language well enough to speak it well enough to make it a code. And these guys 
um, what was taking a machine to do this code over an hour and a half to do these guys could do in seconds they could speak the code decode it and the message was was given they were also just like the Tuskegee guys just like the Nisei guys they were incredibly good at their jobs and they became known as the Navajo code talkers and nobody ever broke their code not ever so very very smart idea with the United States Marines now here's another little thing that I do want to add every Navajo talker had an an American escort that they were paired with and so here's these guys that know every secret that there is to know they're the they're doing it in code they're listening to the code and they're recoding it to spread it on to somebody else they know every secret that there is and so they're super super important and it's very important that none of them get captured ever so the guy that they're paired with that white military marine that they're paired with his job is not just to keep the Navajo talker alive and get him to, you know, make sure that he can give all these messages. His other job is to make sure that the Navajo code talker dies if he's ever captured. And that is very well understood by the two of them, that if, if we are going to be captured, I'm going to have to shoot the code talker. And the code talkers knew that and did it anyway. There is nothing braver than that to me. So another group of incredible guys. All right, and we also have pop culture. Pop culture during this time period was all about what was happening in the movies. And the movies were often used by the government to sway the public. So every, every movie out there was created to either make the Germans look really, really evil or to make the American military guys look really, really good. And I have this clip. It is a Disney clip, which means that I can't actually put the clip in my video. They won't let me but I am going to publish a um, I'm going to put up a link you're going to have to pause the computer and you're going to have to type it in and I know that stinks but you have got to see this cartoon and what Disney produced in order to get people to believe that the Germans were evil okay so watch the video clip after you watch it we are actually done with World War II and so I guess I will see you in the next unit which will be the Cold War so see you soon enjoy the movie